Hi, Leslie. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a very exciting program. Looking very much forward to spending the next hour with you. Um, my name is Leslie Milano, and I'm the president of WDC. Um, very much looking forward to speaking today with Nadia Hashimi. And before we do that, I just want to thank uh, a few people here at WDC. I'd like to thank Barbara Zelenko for bringing us this program today, along with Diana Conway, um, and Scott Weber, Destiny Drake West, and Lisa Maria for helping us to provide this program to all of you. So thank you to everyone who came out on Saturday for our happy hour for our members. That was really exciting. We have some really great programming coming up as well. Um, and I will we'll go through the slides now and I can tell you a little bit more about all of that. So here we are, WDC. We are a vibrant network of politically active women and men. Actually, we are right now in our membership campaign. So if you are membership Damn, is due, be very much this. interested in having you um, renew your membership with us. So over 60 years uh, as a large politically active, diverse club of women and men. Um, certainly get your spouse to join as well as I have. On the um, and we, uh, we do a lot of uh, different programming, um, speaker series, community education, we do a lot of advocacy, uh, get out the vote, happy hours and more. So really are so happy that you are a member with us. If you're not a member, we'd love for you to be a member. Um, but we also would love to encourage you to become even an even more active member as well. So we'll go to the next slide. That's supposed to be. And there. this is our WDC. Uh, these are the committees. Um, and we are always looking for more folks to join us here. Next slide. I don't want my audio. And uh, this is our executive committee. And um, we're very excited to have everyone here on the call with us today. Next slide, thank you. Here's just a few of the different events that we've had um, recently. We just did one on redistricting in Montgomery County that was yeah. really well attended. Um, and so keep going. If you could mute your line, that would be great as well. This call is being, this presentation is being recorded. It will be available after this event as well. So the next event that we have Monday, October 4th at 1 p.m. It's actually going to be just a half hour presentation. It's a conversation with DNC Chair Jamie Harrison. We would love for you to join us there as well. If you have questions, and we are assuming that you will, please submit those questions via the chat feature to Q&A. And we will be able to um, retrie retrieve them in that way and ask our guest today, Nadia Hashimi. Great. Well, thank you. And I think that um, I wanted to actually have Nadia's um, bio up so I could talk a little bit about her before I, I send it over to her. Um, here we go. Uh, and actually, before I um, read to you what's on here, I want to say that I actually met Nadia. Nadia, I don't know if you remember this, but I believe I met Nadia in 2018 at a WDC event. Um, so that's actually really coming full circle here. Um, and later on, uh, as the, when I was in the PTA here for one of my children, we actually purchased one of Nadia's books for everyone in the school. Um, I, I actually didn't have anything to do with that. It was um, the PTA had read about Nadia as well and really wanted to do, move that forward. And I was happy to make the connection, but we're so excited to have her here today. Author of four novels, the most recent uh, work of historical fiction, Sparks Like Stars. Uh, and then she's also a pediatrician formerly at Children's Hospital and a former candidate for Congress. That's where we had met previously, member of the U.S. Afghan Women's Council, Afghan American Foundation, and Moco County Commission on Health. 
Thank you so much. She has a great uh, educational background as well. Let you read that there. Um, but without further ado, would love to turn this over to Nadia to tell us more about what's happening in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie, and to the entire team for putting this together. Um, and thank you all for, for tuning in and joining. Um, I'm first and foremost just glad to be having a conversation around this because, um, you know, there's so much that has been happening. And for, I think for our community, it's been a very emotional time um, and uh, and a time where we felt like, oh, you know, there are a lot of emotions that are really running high with this in terms of, of betrayal, of feeling distraught, of, of, you know, looking for signs of hope somewhere. So, um, so being able to have these conversations with people who are in my own community who care um, and are engaged, uh, it's, it's gratifying and it's giving me some hope. So I'm going to, I did prepare some slides so that you would be having something more interesting to look at than just me talking. Um, so let me move over here. So what we're going to do is take a little bit of a look back to see what's happened, but I've really kind of framed the conversation today as a bit of a myth buster. So we're going to take down some of the false narratives that are floating around in conversations around what happened in Afghanistan, what might happen going forward. Uh, especially in the recent set of events. So, okay, so first things first, if I leave you with nothing else today, I think names are really important. And this is something that's commonly misspoken in the in, in conversations around Afghan people. And so the people are Afghans, the money are that's called Afghanis. And so a lot of times, I think most of the time we hear people talking about the Afghani people, but Afghan people, we call them ourselves Afghans. So if I leave you with nothing else, then that's a huge piece. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about where Afghanistan is and the kind of, you know, the situation there specifically with regards to any of the, you know, the things that you can find on Wikipedia, but it is a very diverse country. It's got um, several different languages. The majority of the people speak either Dari or Pashto or some other smaller dialect. And there's a lot of uh, bilingual to multilingual people in Afghanistan as well. It's got rural areas, it's got urban areas, it's got four seasons, um, and it's got interesting neighbors. Um, so I'm going to hone in specifically on what's been happening on, in the last 18 months to two years, because that's really what has created these, you know, this situation right now and what we've been seeing since, um, since the beginning of August. So back in February of 2020, the U.S. decided that it was going to move its withdrawal into a more specific plan. And it ultimately, at that point, had reached a deal that it signed with the Taliban. And that came after um, after kind of a longstanding period of engagement with leadership of the Taliban to create a framework to create this deal. And so many of us are sitting and waiting and watching and thinking, okay, what does a deal with the Taliban look like? And sometimes it was called a peace deal. Sometimes it was called, you know, some kind of agreement. But that deal with the Taliban was one that I have to say was pretty deeply flawed um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, for one, it really didn't get the United States very much at all. It offered a timeline for a withdrawal. It did make a move facilitating 5,000 Taliban prisoners to be released from Afghan prison. It encouraged the Taliban to sit down with the existing Afghan government. Um, it made no mention of women. Um, and interestingly, it did have a note asking the Taliban not to launch attacks uh, or not to permit anyone to launch attacks on the U.S. or its allies from Afghanistan. So basically not to allow the, a safe haven to be created for terrorism. Um, and it also asked the Taliban not to give passports or issue passports to people who would seek to do harm to the United States. And so it really put a lot of authority um, and inflated the Taliban, put them on the world stage. And what happened after that was there was an escalation in violence that happened in Afghanistan. Across the country, there were targeted assassinations happening on key members of civil society, on women judges, on journalists. There were attacks at universities, uh, university students, and schools. And so this kind of terror campaign 
spread across the country while the United States was pulling back uh, on its involvement. Um, by December of 2020, we had the existing Afghan government of that time and Taliban leaders had agreed on a framework of talks for them to go forward and sort of set the stage for, you know, what is this going to look like? And there was a pretty widespread agreement that the only way forward was a diplomatic one. It was engaging with the Taliban. It was not going to be a military um, fight to, to see who was going to get control of the country. However, I have to say that the members of the Taliban leadership kind of came and went out of these mo these meetings and the impression that people were getting was that they really weren't there to um, to negotiate with anything um, because for the past 20 years they had believed themselves to be the true authority of Afghanistan living in exile. So by April of 2021, we see that President Biden had announced that the September 11th date would be the withdrawal deadline. By um, July, he announced that he was going to move that date up a little bit, and he pushed it to August 31st. And then by August 6th, the Taliban took the first province that they took in this kind of campaign, and that was the province of Nimroz, and then other provinces sort of fell successively. I think you probably remember hearing on the news of, you know, day after day, that it was just one province falling after another. And so it sort of, you know, put this country into a, a stunned state. By August 15th, the then president, Ashraf Ghani, fled the country and the Taliban um, came into Kabul, entered Kabul, and took the city. And then from there, we moved into this really devastating evacuation phase. Um, and so the evacuation phase was, um, was very chaotic. This all of a sudden turned the airport into the deadliest place in Kabul at the time. Um, and, you know, there were there were not just the explosions that you saw that one attack that um, that I believe ISIS has claimed responsibility for, but just the amount of panic that was happening in the country and the lack of logistical planning really created a situation where there were swarms of people, where there was desperation. And so many people died just in the situation uh, in and around the airport. This is um, this canal uh, is full of sewage and this was running out of the airport, but people were having to cross through it in order to get access to one of the gates at the airport. And this is one of the um, the flights kind of the military flights coming out of the country and how packed it was. So I can tell you that on a personal note, you know, we have family in Kabul. And uh, we had been trying to see, you know, is this a good time for them to go? And it was really hard to encourage family uh, to make a decision to go to the airport because on the one hand, I'm hearing from my, my sources of how treacherous it was, how dangerous it was. And we would periodically get alerts issued by State Department that there were heightened risks for a terrorist attack. So a lot of this was anticipated. Um, and there was just a lot of chaos. I mean, you can imagine getting a text message saying, you know, Abbey Gate is open for the next one hour if you want to send people in that direction. And then you can imagine the, the, the groups of people who are probably getting these kinds of messages and then the push and pull as, as you know, families and individuals are trying to move towards some kind of access. The Taliban were controlling part of the the area. Other people were controlling some other parts, and so there really there wasn't a perimeter, right? So you've got this one road that goes to the airport, and then the Taliban along the way in the city had set up checkpoints. And so some of the things that we were hearing was that the Taliban were checking people, looking for people who were looking to leave the country, and that people were getting beaten. That minority populations were um, being specifically targeted as they were trying to make their way to um, to exit from the country. Country. So there was just a lot that happened in and around, uh, and unfortunately, there wasn't a, a wider perimeter that would allow people with documents to be checked at a certain point and then get closer to the airport where the gates really were to uh, permit manifested individuals to get onto flights. Okay, so I really want to, you know, make this a conversation about false narratives because sometimes there are some talking points that float around that um, that I, th I think really deserve a bit of conversation around. So I'm going to just go one by one and then we'll get to our conversation. 
Um, so first and foremost, that the Taliban represent Afghan values. And I think this comes up when people think about, you know, well, we can't go in there and impose democracy on people. We can't go in there and try to push our views. And uh, and to, to an extent, I, I, I agree with that. I think that there always has to be cultural awareness. And I think one of the recognitions um, retrospectively is that the people who were deciding how and where we engage with Afghanistan as the U.S., did not fully understand the culture and those were some of the reasons that led to some of the mistakes that were made but i have to tell you that the taliban also do not represent afghan values it's very hard to say that uniformly there are afghan values but me growing up in this afghan culture and just about every afghan that i know um, in response to some very clear visuals, and I hate to bring it down to clothing because that's such a superficial way of looking at things, but just as one example of culture, Afghan clothing is richly ornate, it is colorful, it is, um, it is like a party in itself, right? And what we're seeing now floating around by the Taliban is that this is what a classroom looks like in a university, in, in Kabul University. And so this was a picture that they had circulated saying that these are women who are showing up and they are supportive of the Taliban. I would keep in mind that the Taliban are everywhere holding guns. And so if they were standing outside this classroom, handing everyone one of these black shrouds and saying, you must enter this room and put this on and hold this flag, I don't know what you would expect a woman to do. Now, this is my conjecture, but um, but I have never seen Afghan women dress in this way. Even women who have worn the the burqa or the chaleri, the blue one, um, that has been indigenous and that has been used in different parts of the country historically, pre-Taliban, and that's fine. But this kind of cover where it requires even gloves for some of these women and this entire like head to toe shrouding in black is not something that is indigenous or has been seen in Afghan culture. The Afghan culture is also very rich with um, with music and uh, you know hospitality, and there's so many aspects of it that are just not in line. It is also one that has emphasized education and has encouraged women to um, to pursue education and girls to pursue education, which is actually also in line with the Islamic faith, because uh, the whole point, the, the first words of the Quran really are about reading to understand. The, um, the Taliban are also a bit of a construct, right? And so, you know, what I wanted to do in even Sparks Like Stars in my most recent novel is to, to, to do a little bit back in time and take a look of what, what was happening on the ground. Afghanistan's always been a country that's been, um, you know, sort of afflicted by proxy wars and colonialism, imperialism, and those kinds of conquests. But specifically in the 79 to 89 period, we had the Soviet invasion. And for a lot of, um, for a lot of people, the narrative really centers around that moment as being the fall of Afghanistan, is that 1979 moment that um, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and, oh my gosh, look at what happened, look at what they did to the country. Um, and you know the the people of Afghanistan have really fallen victim to this Cold War tension and the mentalities that happened around that time. The United States had a presence in Afghanistan prior to going in in two thousand one, um, and even prior to its involvement with the freedom fighters or the mujahideen who were fighting against the Soviets. So. Going back into the 60s and in the 70s, the United States had sent, um, you know, different kinds of projects from the Peace Corps to its diplomats to engaging with, you know, building different projects in the country that sort of mirrored the engagement of the Soviet Union. And it almost became a little like tug of war game during peacetime, but one that was really pulling at the political fabric of the country as, you know, these two superpowers were trying to uh, win favor over this country that sits rather strategically. And so, you know, you've got stories like Charlie Wilson's war, um, but the Americans were really militarizing and, uh, and, you know, encouraging the Afghan freedom fighters to fight off the Soviets. Um, and that may be fine, but I think we all have to take that in context of what was what was the point of the American interests here. And the Stinger missile, so what Reagan had done was he authorized the, the US to give Stinger missiles to 
the freedom fighters. And that was really a symbolic move because once the Stinger missiles were out in the field, um, the Soviets understood it was very clear and it was very blatant that this was something that was being backed by the United States. Up until that point, things had been rather covert. Um, so after the Soviet Union's withdrawal um, between 88 to 96, there was a period of just civil war in the country. And it is from within that turmoil and that chaos that you have the, um, the Taliban emerge. And the Taliban took over from 96 to 01. And just to go back one more one more point that I would like to make is that interestingly between 86 to 94 in that period, um, the USAID organization, which is part of the US government had awarded a grant to the University of Omaha uh, and Nebraska. And it was about 50 to actually $51 million. And they were working with um, with different organizations to fund textbooks that had these is Islamist and jihadi themes to them. And so you can see from some of, you know, this is how they're, they were, the textbooks were teaching small children to count. It's by counting weapons. And, you know, if you take a look at what they were talking about in the language here, it's, you know, jim is the letter for J, jim is for jihad. And so there was really an indoctrination that was deliberate in the children. Um, now, UNICEF at some point went in and said that these books should be taken out of circulation, you know, some years later. And so this was decommissioned. The books were supposed to be taken out of circulation. But I've seen academicians write about going into these areas um, and finding these books still in circulation or fresh reprints of them um, being available. So these things, you know, once created, they do find ways to linger. All right, next one. Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. There's, you know, a book about this. This is what people say all the time. And, um, you know, I think that that's, that goes back to the this idea that Afghans do not like to be invaded. They will always resist and they can never be conquered. And there's a lot of pride in the Afghan community around that. Um, you know, these helmets that you're seeing here are from the Greeks, the British, and, uh, and then the Soviets, and, and then the United States, and sort of this, you know, no superpower, no matter how large, can ever survive coming in or ever actually conquer Afghanistan. But, um, but the thing is that also, you know, who is the, the other victim? It's also the graveyard of Afghans. And so we have a lot of Afghans who have lost their lives um, as a result of all these engagements. And we've got a lot of widows. We've got a lot of, um, a lot of tombstones, a lot of people who have suffered all kinds of injuries, all kinds of emotional and, um, and psychological distress as a result of this kind of, of you know, repetitive conflict that affects the country. Okay, so this is a big one. We've been hearing a lot about this in the last couple of years, especially around the topic of the withdrawal and deciding what the United States' role um, should be going forward. The United States spent $2.3 trillion on Afghanistan on this war. When you take a closer look at those numbers, a startling majority of it went to military contracts. And so if you look at this infographic here, um, this is citing that $2 trillion went to five weapons companies during the Afghan war, the war in Afghanistan. And so these five companies have made out really well. And one of the, one of the big complaints from the Afghan people has really been that the United States keeps, keeps touting that it's invested so much and it's putting so much money into the, into the country. And yet what people were seeing on the ground was that a lot, a lot of the money that was coming in was actually going through a contractor to the hands of a subcontractor and, uh, and very little of it actually making an impact in the economy of Afghanistan or on the infrastructure of Afghanistan. Um, so, you know, we just have to take these numbers that are thrown around with a bit of a grain of salt and do a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, let's keep going. Again, this is just, there is so much. And a lot of these companies even now are moving into like Amentum, uh, which was one of the DOD contractors, is now working on helping build facilities on the military bases where the newly arrived Afghans are being housed. And so these companies have been very creative in flexing their capabilities and always being you know, ready on the scene to find other ways to um, partner. Um, the other issue is the lobbying. 
right? And so this this uh, person who has been just a, a very insightful voice on Twitter has cited that the top five weapons firms spent one billion dollars lobbying Congress during that the, the period of war in Afghanistan, and they received two trillion in Pentagon contracts as a result. And so their return on investment is is pretty stellar. Um, the other involvement of, of money has really been in ties with, um, you know, taking a look at the corruption in the country. Well, it's pretty well documented that in the CIA's involvement in Afghanistan, really just going back, um, and I highly recommend Steve Cole's two books on this topic, that there were there was a lot of actual cash going into the country. And in a country that is just being sort of built or rebuilt from the ground up, where you've got all these different warring factions, where you've got a very complicated landscape, coming in with bundles of, of cash and telling people, you know, we'll give you money if you turn over, you know, um, insurgents to us or people who are enemies to us. If we'll give you money if you do such and such. You had a lot of, of um of things that were happening on the ground that were not necessarily the outcomes that the Americans had intended. Okay. Um, I was just having a conversation the other day with someone who is part of a think tank in Washington, and he said to me, well, at least, uh, at least for 20 years, we introduced some rights for the women in Afghanistan. And I had to tell him that what we saw happening in the last 20 years was not because the United States had introduced women's rights to Afghanistan. This was muscle memory. My mother graduated from Kabul University as a civil engineer. She went on to get her master's degree. Her sisters went to the university. This was all before the United States was in there with a military purpose. Um, 1919, Afghan women were uh, given the right to vote. And I know that the people in this room recognize uh, how that date matches up with, um, with what happened in the women's suffrage movement in the United States. These are pictures from, you know, I don't know when in Afghanistan, but definitely before the United States went in, in in 2001. And, you know, part of women's rights and part of the women's presence in the public sphere is not just their ability to go to school or their ability to be part of the political process um, or be professionals, but also their involvement in the arts. And so this is a picture down the corner of uh, Mawash, which is who is one of the most prominent female singers and um and she has been around for a very long time so women had a, a long history of having rights and the ability to engage in very public spheres in the country of course the country is very variable what happens in the rural areas the more conservative areas is not represented by what happens in Kabul. but guess what that's a phenomenon for every country um in 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 looking at what was happening around that week of you know from the august 6th to august 15th when all of these provinces were falling i mean one of the things that people were commenting on is oh my gosh the afghans they didn't even fight for their country and this one hurt this one hurt because of the number of people who actually really did you know lose their lives and gave their lives in order to build this country and you know not just in partnership with the united states or other allies but on the ground independently and under the, the purview of the Afghan government, as problematic as it was, these are real people who really gave their, gave their everything. And so if we're looking at war deaths in Afghanistan, and this includes Pakistan too, but I think the overwhelming majority of you have seen these numbers circulate really just for Afghanistan. If you're looking at you know, service members, we've got nearly 70,000 deaths. Um, in the country. And again, this is just a heavy toll. Every single one of these is is then um, a family that has been traumatized. Uh, civilian deaths have have actually risen in the past couple of years. So the Afghan people, again, just have paid very heavily. And you even see on here categories of journalists and humanitarian aid workers. Um, journalists, again, are very targeted and humanitarian aid workers were not safe either. Um, and one of the other things that had been happening is um, is these airstrikes that that the US, United States had launched, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this later. But um, just this is just another way that we were really seeing a lot of civilians and um, and just the general Afghan population sort of being traumatized and uh, and impacted by by the tactics that were used in this engagement. 
And so I say that because one of the the points that President Biden has made is in that shifting our engagement in Afghanistan now that he's going to move to an over the horizon counterterrorism strategy, uh, which will help us stay safe and still, you know, reach part of our mission of of making the United States and that region a more stable and safe territory. But um, but as you can see from this previous slide, the number of civilian deaths has been staggering. And this is in conjunction with having actual assets and intelligence on the ground in Afghanistan. The more removed our presence is from the country, the less accuracy we'll have, less precision we'll have, the more bad information we'll have. And, and what happens with these kinds of strikes is that it creates a lot of ill will, a lot of resentment. And this is part of the narrative that I think that the, uh, the American people don't really get to understand. Um, I will tell you that the drone companies do very well. They're making great profits on this too. Um, Save the Children had estimated that the real number of direct child casualties of this conflict will likely be much higher than the estimated almost 33,000. And it does not include children who have died due to hunger, poverty, and disease. So those are all the secondary causes of death, um, children who are in countries that are affected by war. Most notably, um, you know, what happened after, after there was that horrific attack around the airport that claimed nearly 200 lives um, in Kabul, and then President Biden had come out and said, you know, that this was, that they were going to get revenge for this, that we're going to find you, we're going to get you, and there were two drone strikes that happened in response to that. Um, and I have to tell you that his remarks that day were... I think they were they were hot blooded and and seemed to force the United States to take some action just to show that they could have the last word, the final word, and that we could still had some reach in the country. And unfortunately, what happened was that an entire family essentially was obliterated um, in this drone attack. And so these are the faces of the children uh, who were killed in that attack. And I share that because I think it's really important to recognize that when we see resentment, when we see criticism about the United States' involvement and how it chooses to engage and how it chooses to disengage, these are the people um, that the Afghan people are thinking of. These are the people who are in the caskets and that's what's creating um, what will be our ongoing relationship with the country. It was not a mission accomplished. Um, I like this infographic because it really demonstrates, you know, so much of the war was kind of about saving the women of Afghanistan, um, but it really, when it came down to the withdrawal and our exit, uh, this was much more of an afterthought. The new Taliban Ministry of Interior is someone who's been on the FBI most wanted list. And so, you know, the new government, I think, is also being touted as a new evolved Taliban, which is it, it is not. And so that leads us to, you know, the road ahead. Um, there are a lot of geopolitical factors at play between uh the, between Russia, between China, between Pakistan, between India. So all of these internal tensions kind of play out on the field in Afghanistan as well. So we're going to continue to see different people have different layers of influence. What the Taliban are doing, they have a really focused PR campaign and they have for the last couple of years. And so there is actually, I think they're using other dedicated and very polished PR networks to talk about how they are evolved and how they are reformed, but what is happening on the ground is a very different story. So in the field of journalism, for example, in 2020, there were 700 women journalists working in Afghanistan. The Afghan media has been a thriving entity that has just really given a lot of um, people an ability to have freedom of speech. And at this point now, we've got 39 female journalists. This I don't know what this number is today. Everything changes day by day. Very recently, um, the Taliban had beaten these two journalists um, who are also members of a minority community. And they were you know, brave enough to share these photos online. And a week later, after these photos had gone viral, a member of the Taliban leadership had um, gone to the, um, the newspaper's office and apologized to them, which you know, they rightly said they did not really 
accept uh, or believe their apology very much. The road ahead is also going to be a product of the layered problems in Afghanistan. So the Taliban are not the only problem in Afghanistan. Um, the other problems are that there have been barriers to healthcare access, which include cost, availability of professionals, and then the ongoing conflict and security issues. There are natural disasters like drought and earthquake. Um, in periods of, of chaos, there were also a lot of crimes, kidnappings, and theft. Now, in some areas, um, now that the Taliban has taken control, people are saying that they actually feel safer and that these petty crimes have stopped and some of the kidnappings may have stopped um, or have decreased because people are in fear of, of the type of punishment that the Taliban bring out. And so, you know, while that might sound good, but it's also, it, it, I would use a lot of caution in how excited we can get about the, the um, decrease in, in crimes going on. Uh, we also see a lot of human rights abuses that are at the hands of the Taliban. COVID is still an issue. Um, the war for Afghans is not over because there is now this group, you know, ISIS or, or whatever these smaller factions are calling themselves. Sometimes the Taliban say that, yes, there's ISIS here, there's Al Qaeda here, and those are the ones who are, you know, launching these terrorist attacks. And then other times you hear Taliban members saying there is no ISIS, there is no Al Qaeda. Um, those may be just a couple of rogue people, but we don't really have those kinds of, we are not allowing this country to be a safe haven for, for terrorists. Either way, when an explosion happens and it claims lives, an explosion happened and, and, and someone was responsible for it. Poverty is a huge issue and it has exacerbated recently because of uh, the lack of jobs, because with the Taliban takeover, a lot of people acutely lost their jobs and there really hasn't been a push to create new jobs by this new regime. Illiteracy is a problem as well, which leads to all other kinds of ramifications and then sanitation, access to clean water. And again, just the targeted killings and sort of this terrorist campaign. The Taliban, you know, from from what I'm hearing from people on the ground are still engaging and sort of hunting down people who were affiliated with the previous government who had worked with different security forces in the international community so there is a lot that's happening behind the scenes um, that we don't really get to hear about other than hearing through our networks through our channels and from people on the ground this right here is a picture of this um, the orchestra in afghanistan and the musical instruments that were destroyed what gives me hope the only thing that can give me hope is honestly um the resilience of the people there and their sort of unending grit and willingness to stand up and so see but these are some of the women who have been protesting and they have been protesting since the country fell to the taliban um so you know i hope that people will recognize that it is a very changed country i think the taliban will soon recognize that they're not walking into the same country that they took in 1996 this is very different they may be the same but um the afghan people and their spirit is is um, in a very different place so that is all for my slides wow <clears throat> that is really uh, both enlightening and, and sobering. So thank you very much, Nadia, for sharing that presentation with us today. We do have a number of questions. I also have a number of questions I haven't put into the list here, but I will start with the uh, questions for from the audience. So the first question here is, should the US and other governments unfreeze the Afghan funds they hold? What conditions should be imposed? So that's a great question. It's been a real challenge and one that, you know, in my advocacy, I'm in an advocacy circle with other women who, who look at the situation for women in Afghanistan. And in this group are women who are in Afghanistan, who have recently fled Afghanistan, who are in international community as well. And the challenge is that unfreezing those assets may open them up to the Afghan people, but it also may empower the Taliban regime, right? And so, it, we cannot expect that they will be noble in uh, in their use of those funds because what they have been looking for is authority of control and making sure that they have all the capacity that they need to run the show as they see fit. Their priorities in terms of what the country needs may not be in line with what the people of Afghanistan actually need. Um, and so so it becomes very challenging and this is the same question that we deal with when we take a look at humanitarian aid you know how do we support the people of afghanistan how do we not penalize them for being there 
um, and dealing with things like drought and and poverty and this poor access to healthcare, it's a very dependent country when it comes to foreign aid. So how do we balance that with you know? But but how do we get the money through the Taliban? Part of it is a recognition that even in the past 20 years, there was some U.S. money that was going to the Taliban because in order to conduct certain, you know, construction projects or whatever, part of the funds uh, might be given as a bribe to a Taliban group that was controlling a small area so that they could pass through and get to what they needed to to do. So it, it's it's complex. I think the, the key points are what kinds of pieces of accountability can be placed on the Taliban to make sure that there is some protection for human rights, to make sure that there's some oversight to what they're doing, um, specifically for women and girls and minorities in the country, um, for journalists, for the things that just matter so much from a very basic human rights level. And right now we don't have any, we don't have any deliverables from the Taliban. And even from the agreement that was signed in 2020, there's very little that that was asked of them other than just to show up to have a conversation. Sorry, I was muted there. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, the next question is, uh, when, so have you been able to have real conversations with friends and relatives in Afghanistan in recent months, in recent, you know, since the withdrawal has happened, um, we're assuming they're concerned about their security and safety. You know what's happening on the ground there. Have you have you know have you been able to travel there anytime in recent um, years? And you know just give us a little bit of a paint that picture a little bit for us. We'd like to know how they how your friends and family are doing. Sure. So I um, I went to Afghanistan in 2003 and it, things were really, really good then because it was just after the intervention. So the situation was, you know, probably in its best. Um, since then, you know, it's kind of gone through like ups and down periods in terms of security, but it's been OK. Uh, and people have been traveling back and forth for, you know, for visiting family, for business, for, for pleasure or whatnot. Um, very recently, I can say that family members that we've had from my side, from my husband's side, um, and then people that I sort of am acquainted with through the work that I do. Um, in recent, in the last two years, none of these people that we're now talking to in a very different way, none of them had expressed that they wanted to leave the country. People were there and they were fine. I'll give you the example of my cousin, my first cousin who's there in the country. Um, she and I have not had much interaction because we've been living in two different worlds, right? And I have a lot of cousins, so it's really hard to keep up with everybody. Um, but she and her husband have been living in there and they had no intention of leaving. He had worked as an interpreter with the ISAP, with the International Security Forces. Um, and what's happened now is that members of the Taliban are almost literally like hunting down these individuals who had worked with ISAF. And, you know, so I'm getting text messages as they're trying to flee, as they're going to the airport. They were there the day of the explosion. Luckily, they made it out of that territory without um, having any of their eight children harmed. But, um, but what happened was that this was you know, this was uh, the kind of territory that you, you wouldn't expect. Uh, and that's why these people never thought about leaving before. They were there. They were committed to living their lives. My husband's family, the same. They had been working in different parts of the government, either working in like, I mean, something as small as kitchen staff to the presidential palace. But these people are now very afraid for what the retributions might be for them. Um, so right now, our people are kind of laying low. There's a lot of uncertainty about what will be allowed, what will not be allowed, um, what will, you know, wh what kind of, what kind of future are they gonna have for their children, for their daughters? Girls are now allowed to go to school up until sixth grade. And then they're saying that they're going to keep allowing women in universities. And I don't know if they have figured out that you need to go to like seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grade in order to then go to a university. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, I get a lot of messages from women who are activists who are involved in different, you know, um, different kind of high profile fields. I get um, other messages from journalists who are saying that they have been threatened, um, that people have come. Um, we have one sort of, you know, distant contact or relative 
who had um, there had been an attack on his life as a journalist, um, but in the car instead of him that day was his father, and so he lost his father to that attack. So it, there's there is a lot going on. So there are some days I think where we get the sense that things feel just quiet but okay without the jobs that they had before. Um, so there's just a lot of uncertainty, I would say. Um, there is a there's a thread of like a strain of thought that I heard both um, I think in news outlets and then also reiterated by individuals that um, when the withdrawal happened that you know it was it was time to do this we couldn't keep staying and you know the Taliban know that they are going to have to deal with the U.S. and the international community and therefore. Um, you know, they're not, it's not going to be the old Taliban the way that they were. So, which just sounded, you know, to me, who, who has tracked uh, a lot of this, just absolutely ridiculous. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, can you sort of counter that or tell us if that is what your perspective is on that? I mean, maybe it is, maybe it is true and I, I don't know. Um, and then yeah. also in terms of, uh, you know, the day-to-day differences for women that you know who are there you know what has changed for them so far yeah so um you know i think that what the united states people in the united states and i think that the people in afghanistan were in relative agreement that the time for the withdrawal had come right and so that's that's another you know like false false dichotomy that was like well should we continue this endless war or should we just leave but there was there's a lot in between and there is a way to withdraw that could lead to some kind of more stable conditions on the ground there. There's also things that should have been done during that 20 period, the 20 year period of engagement across multiple presidents and administrations that could have been done better. And um, and so one thing I never want to see anyone do, and it frustrates me to no end, is to pin this on one party or another, because Afghanistan's uh, history with this country has gone, you know, from from president to president, and sometimes between presidents, it really doesn't change very much. Um, uh, so I don't want this to be a talking point for one party or another. Um, but but you know what what we saw was like, okay, well, if we're going to have terms of a withdrawal couldn't those terms require that the Taliban and the existing Afghan government actually reach some kind of decision, actually come to some kind of conclusion, other than saying, you guys really should talk once we leave. And, um, and so those are some of the pieces that I think, you know, taking a look at how do we, how do we build in accountability? How do we include some talking points or some, you know, um, some not even fine print, but some basic print in this agreement with the Taliban that said that you must respect human rights. And it seems so very basic and such a small ask, right, that you will allow the international community to have some kind of oversight, uh, allow some transparency with what you're doing, that we can provide some guidelines for what basic human rights would look like in an administration going forward where the Taliban could be included in a government. And so they all their promises really amounted to very little. And, and that could have been done still in line with a US withdrawal of its military presence in the country. Um, so the when you ask about, you know, the day to day life of women and how things are changing, you know, I think for girls, for, if you're starting from the girls, right, so girls who are going to school, um, what their academic progress can look like is very, very different, right? Because if they're capped at sixth grade, that's one thing. The other thing, especially in the early days, was a lot of just fear and uncertainty of like, you know, okay, they're saying we're allowed to go to school, but are we really allowed to go to school? Because there is historical memory too, right? And there's also the memory, not just of 96 to 01, which these children are too small to remember, but their parents might not be. But there's also the acknowledgement that the Taliban up until, you know, for their lives has been an insurgent group that has launched attacks. Uh, and these attacks have made their way to schools as well. And so it becomes very scary, 
for a girl to decide that she's going to go to school, that she's going to pursue an education. Um, I got a, a message on social media from a girl who's a, a university student in Afghanistan, and she was saying that, you know, she has to go to school. Um, the next day was her first day back at school. This was, you know, after they had decided to reopen. And uh, and she said, I'm really scared because it's a it's a long way and I'm, I'm really scared of what they're going to do and what they're going to say. Um, and when I was talking to her about these images that were floating around of these women kind of, you know, dressed in, in all black, she wrote back to me and she says, I know I, I saw those and it was really scary. I think she goes to a different school and she said that I'm still wearing the clothes that I was wearing before and this is how I'm resisting. So you know, there's different things that are happening. I've also heard from uh, one uh, female official, a government official in Afghanistan who's still there. And she had said that her, her nieces and nephews usually come to visit her. Or they would come to her apartment. And after the Taliban took over, one of them expressed to her that the 12 year old said she didn't want to go. And when she asked why, she said, well, she's afraid to get on the street because she's 12. And she was really worried about how the Taliban would see her. Would they see her as marriageable age and want to just take her take her away so there is a lot of fear of that um, we have had family members who have been threatened by the taliban directly um you know for for you know different kinds of like family dynamics come to play where some families have now decided well it makes more sense to join the taliban than to say that we are you know resisting them and and then this causes a lot of you know internal dynamics and and fear um within the family professionally the women journalists have lost their jobs um all these women parliamentarians are you know they're being told by the taliban they're basically being laughed at and saying you are you are nothing now Thank you. Um, so next question, I have, I probably have another five questions. We're not going to get to that because we only have seven minutes. So um, we'll try to go through these as quickly as we can. Um, you know, in terms of the US uh, and Europe, what do you think that they've learned? Uh, can our purpose of safety and stability be achieved through cultural aid work like through USAID? Um, you know, it's USAID is, it's a great organization. It can only do so much, right? It's, you know, if you take a look at, at, you know, what's happened over the course of the past 20 years, or even the course of the past 40 years in Afghanistan, there's a lot of goodwill that has been built between the Afghan people and Americans, you know, on one side. Um, but then it doesn't take much. You can see, you know, a couple of drone strikes and you really start to create these pockets of, of deep resentment. And when you see things like the United States, you know, you know, walking out and not really laying any kind of groundwork or not really talking about women's rights, which for a while was such a battle cry, that is a, it's very easy for people to point to that and say, you know, the the intentions were not as pure or as noble as um, as the United States might have um, wanted the world to believe. So, you know, I think that what really needs to happen and hopefully what is happening outside of just panel discussions in Washington or in different, you know, academic institutions is taking a look at what the geopolitics are, how diplomacy can um, can kind of pave the way for smarter interactions with taking a look at, you know, okay, we've got the Taliban, where are the Taliban getting their funding from? Where are they getting their military weapons from? Other than now the things that have, um, you know, whatever amount of it has been left behind, but, but taking a look at sort of the bigger picture, because that's really what has been key to Afghanistan's um, prognosis in different periods of time has been, you know, who are the key factors? Who's looking at what? I mean, going back to when the um, when the English had gone in there and the first Anglo-Afghan wars, it was really them kind of trying to protect India from the influence of the Soviet Union. So, so just taking a step back rather than saying, okay, what can we do in this one particular village in Afghanistan? You know, how do we build some goodwill locally? That's important too but there also has to be integration with a bigger picture strategy. So next question is, I'm going to combine two questions here. You know, at what point should the Taliban be regarded as the legitimate government of the Afghan people? And what would you say would be, you know, the best outcome moving forward? 
So I, I don't think it's for me to say, you know, I think the will of the Afghan people, it's really hard because they can't, they have not had the opportunity to express their, their will. I will say that there have been many, many protests in Afghanistan, which large numbers of people uh, who were protesting before the fall of Kabul. There were people who were coming out onto their balconies one night in support of uh, the the Afghan National Security Forces. So we saw this, you know, campaign of of one night. Everybody came out at a certain hour, and they were just, um, you know, crying out in support of the Ash Afghan National Security Forces. That's a huge demonstration that the people do not did not want the Taliban as their official government, right? Um, and now at this point, you still see protests. You still still see people who are literally like walking up their feet away from Taliban with their, you know, weaponized Taliban members um, in a Taliban, which is, you know, not always directly the people who are kind of patrolling the streets are not always very tightly controlled by the leadership figures. Um, and so they also have a lot of work to do in terms of organizing their structure um, and getting control over what's happening in the streets. But, uh, but you still have people protesting. So again, this is a demonstration that the Afghan people themselves are rejecting this Taliban regime. Now, you know, we've had an uprising and uh, in Panjshir, and that area has sort of been uh, the like the last stronghold of resistance of military resistance. So, you know, it's hard to say that the people themselves should just rise up and everybody kind of, you know, grab a broomstick and go out in battle. So how do you measure the will of the people the only way to measure it, and we know that because we all believe in it, is by giving people a vote, a real vote that matters. And so if the Taliban don't do that, if they were never really willing to step up and say, we'll be part of these elections and give people a chance to choose us, then I don't know how we can acknowledge them and give them that authority. The only issue is how do we work on the issues that need to be worked on for the Afghan people? How do we not forsake the people of Afghanistan? Because we have to figure out what our uh, acknowledging relationship is with the Taliban as a regime. And so that's just, a, you know, a lot more nuance has to go into that decision making. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the levels of food insecurity, including um, there is a question about how pregnant women are faring right now? Um, oh my gosh, and women are so pregnant. <laughs> the uh, the average number of children per woman, they're usually having around five children um, in their lifetimes. Uh, life expectancy, and actually some of the health metrics in the country have been improving, so they've been going in a better direction in terms of maternal mortality, life expectancy, infant mortality. But and and that's you know with the context of things you know in healthcare access improving with international support, right now that's taking sort of a real sharp turn in the negative direction because of you know women who are just afraid to go out and seek care. So you've got just more things that are happening outside of the influence of the medical community or um, like midwives, for example, because people have been more cautious and more hesitant to do anything. So um, so the care that these women need is is limited even more now by a decrease in funding for the services by a limitation in availability in some areas you know i know somebody who is uh whose family member is an OBGYN, and, and that person the OBGYN, was told don't go back to work by the taliban and so there are further limitations on who can work uh there's further access problems for people and especially with widespread poverty that's getting worse dramatically day by day uh, people who in a system where they actually have to pay for their own health care are not able to access it even more. Right. So uh, so it's it's just it's a perfect storm. And I think Human Rights Watch has done some really good reporting on this specifically just before um, Kabul fell. And now they're continuing to do some more deep dives. So as we wrap up here, um, what would you say are three things that we could do? how can we help women and children in afghanistan is there are we totally helpless over here or what can we do we're not totally helpless and i think that you know that's the the power of advocacy and unifying voices is um is to take a look you know georgetown has a great um 
program, which I'm blanking on the name of it. I think it's connected with Vital Voices, but they have um, they have a women, peace and security program. And then they have an initiative specifically to uh, empower Afghan women and continue to support. And that's really the institution, the academic institution under which the U.S. Afghan Women's Council is housed. And that's where you know I sit as one of the council members. And so we take a look through that organization to see how can we empower women in education, um, in economy, and uh, in healthcare as well. And so this is an evolving landscape. So part of what I've been doing in the Afghan community also is seeing, you know, which organizations, the nonprofits or the non uh, the non governmental organizations are still able to do work in Afghanistan are still functioning so that we can funnel some of the goodwill in that direction. Um, and then, of course, policy. Right. So how do we take a look at um, talking to our policy makers here in this country and applying pressure on finding ways to hold the Taliban accountable to make women a priority, to make women's rights a priority. Um, and those are some of the things that have to be done really in collaboration with other countries. And so the people that I'm in touch with sort of behind the scenes, you know, we talk to each other and share statements and share, you know, recommendations. There are women activists who are on the military bases right now who have put out statements um, saying that these are the requests of the Afghan women to please not forsake us. And there will be ongoing conversations with the Taliban. So please ensure that women are at the table in those conversations with this new regime so that we can continue to influence how they create a world for Afghan women and girls going forward. Thank you so much. Wow, what an hour um, this has been with you. Thank you so much for enlightening us and uh, spending this time with us today. Uh, thank you so much, Nadia Hashimi, and thanks so much to, I think we, uh, in our audience, we also had Marcy Frosch, who is the wife of Brian Frosch, who is our Attorney General for Maryland. Thanks so much, Marcy, for being with us on his behalf. And thank you all to all of you who have been with us for this hour as well. We will hope to see you again in October, October 4th, with our DNC Chair, Jamie Harrison. Uh, but again, thank you, Nadia. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you all. And I appreciate the goodwill of the people in my own community here in Maryland, especially with the new arrived Afghan families and for your attention here, because um, if you showed up, it means you care. And I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. And um, this recording will be available on YouTube. We recommend that you share it with a few friends so that we can help to enlighten others about the situation in Afghanistan. Thanks again and have a great weekend. That was really terrific. Thank you. Oh. You good?